Recall from last week, the course objectives are to provide an overview of NASA Earth observation resources available for open ocean and coastal applications, including a basic understanding of remote sensing of aquatic systems, how to access and visualize NASA Earth science data, how to use NASA Earth science data, tools, and products for open ocean and coastal applied science issues, and to conduct live demonstrations of useful ocean and coastal applied science tools. This week, we will be discussing platforms and sensors for ocean observations. Our primary focus will be on NASA data access and software tools. I hope your main takeaway from today is the knowledge of where to access remote sensing data and how you might process these data using NASA's image processing software named CDAS. This week, we will first review some of last week's material. I will give an overview of some of NASA and the US sat US's satellites and sensors for coastal and open ocean applications. I will describe data processing level. We will review some common data access portals for obtaining imagery from these satellites and sensors mentioned. And then finally, I will introduce you to NASA's satellite image processing software named CDAS with more information on how to obtain advanced training. There will be a lot of links to resources throughout this session, so I encourage you to download the presentation after we are finished so you may follow those links. We have also put many of the links into a file you can access in the files pod in the lower right of the screen. And I'm trying to point to it now with a little green arrow in the files pod. So first a review of some important concepts from last week. We have identified 10 thematic areas for coastal and open ocean applied science, marine protected areas, marine fisheries, animal migrations, water quality, harmful algal blooms, or HABs, eutrophication, coral reef health, marsh subsidence, coastal development, and coastal hazards. Last week, I presented some examples of tools that address these themes. These tools incorporate remote sensing imagery and models to address questions in applied science. One example from last week was the HAB tracker tool, which can predict landfall of blooms of the toxic cyanobacterium microcystis in Lake Erie in North America. For the purpose of this webinar series, we will focus on animal migrations and coral reef health, and those will be the topics of the week three and week four sessions. Last week, we reviewed how light interacts with the constituents in the water column and may be re-emitted through the sea surface and sensed by an airborne or satellite sensor. In aquatic remote sensing, we are interested in the radiometric unit remote sensing reflectance, seen here as RRS. Remote sensing reflectance is used in ocean color algorithms to compute the data products of interest for ocean and aquatic science, like chlorophyll concentration or color dissolved organic matter. With this equation, we see the relationship of the inherent optical properties, or absorption and scattering, of the material in the water to the quantity and the quality of light in the underwater light field and the light that is propagated through the surface as the water leaving radiance. It is this remote sensing reflectance quantity that is derived from satellite remote sensing measurements. Because of these relationships of what is in the water to the color of light emitted from it, we can infer concentrations of optically active constituents in the upper part of the water column that the satellite can see. We also learned that in coastal and open ocean applications, we are typically concerned with reflected solar radiation, which <clears throat> we use in ocean color algorithms to infer such properties as chlorophyll, and in emitted infrared and microwave radiation to infer sea surface temperature. We also discussed the importance of accurate atmospheric correction so that the spectral shape of the remote sensing reflectance measured by the satellite accurately represents the remote sensing reflectance at the sea surface. Last week, I mentioned a few legacy and current satellite sensors, including MODIS, Landsat, and SeaWIFS. In the next section, I will go into more detail on some legacy current and future satellite sensors. <clears throat> there are currently several U.S. satellites that are used for the remote sensing of open ocean, coastal, and inland waters. These include Landsat 7 and Landsat 8, 
and the Aqua and Terra satellites. The International Space Station has also, been, has also served as a satellite, and then the Suomi NPP as well. These next two slides provide a reference to the different satellites and sensors that are used for ocean color remote sensing. The Landsat series, including the Thematic Mapper, Enhanced Thematic Mapper, and Operational Land Imager, are used to observe water quality. These sensors provide high spatial resolution imagery, which is particularly valuable in coastal systems where small scale processes can dominate and are otherwise neglected by coarser spatial resolution imagery. The Terra and Aqua satellites each host a moderate resolution imaging spectral radiometer, or MODIS, which senses both reflected visible radiance and emitted thermal energy. MODIS is used for land, ocean, and atmospheric applications and is used to infer several parameters or data products useful for understanding ocean biology, carbon dynamics, and circulation. Other ocean color satellites include the Suomi National Polar Partnership, or NPP, which hosts the Visible Infrared Imaging Radiometer Suite, or VIRS. This sensor is used for spectral reflectance and to infer chlorophyll concentration. The International Space Station can be considered a satellite used for ocean color observations. The Hyperspectral Imager for the Coastal Ocean, or HICO, rode aboard the ISS for five years from 2009 to 2014. This was a high spectral resolution sensor, sometimes referred to as an imaging spectrometer or hyperspectral sensor. Finally, a satellite and sensor that is not yet launched but is under development is the Plankton Aerosols Clouds Ocean Ecosystems, or PACE. This pr proposed hyperspectral sensor is scheduled to launch sometime in 2022 or 2023. The Landsat satellites have been collecting Earth observations since July 1972. The revisit rate is every 16 days. Spatial resolution varies by satellite, but it is typically possible to obtain 30 meter resolution imagery. Despite the relatively long revisit rate of 16 days, Landsat, <clears throat> Landsat is still a useful imaging system to understand some applied science questions for aquatic systems, including marsh subsidence and the effects of eutrophication in inland waters. There is a commitment to continue with the Landsat program as it has been so successful in tracking land use and land change, and more recently with the launch of Landsat 8 with its broader use of aquatic systems. Landsat 7, Enhanced Thematic Mapper, launched in 1999 and has remained in operation since. It is a 16 day, has a 16-day revisit rate. Spectral bands include blue-green, green, red, panchromatic, and reflected and thermal IR. <clears throat> the development of Landsat 8's Operational Land Imager, or OLI, included the addition of another spectral band to improve the remote sensing of aquatic systems. This satellite sensor has the same 16-day revisit rate, and with this additional coastal band, algorithms have been developed to derive chlorophyll, colored dissolved organic matter, and other water constituents. If you look here on the right, I've brought up another image. <clears throat> As you can see, there's a nice paper from Franz et al. 2015 where they compare Landsat 8 OLI to MODIS estimates of chlorophyll in the Chesapeake Bay in the USA. Despite Landsat's infrequent revisit rate compared to MODIS, having a spatial resolution of 30 meters compared to one kilometer is a big advantage in coastal systems due to the scale of the dynamic processes that occur here. The Sentinel-2A satellite from the European Space Agency was recently launched and observes its similar spectral bands to Landsat 8 OLI and at a finer spatial and temporal resolution than Landsat 8. It may be of interest to some of you, but we will not be discussing it as a part of this webinar series. The workhorse for much of ocean color remote sensing are the MODIS imagers on the Terra and Aqua satellites. Terra collects in the morning, and Aqua collects in the afternoon. There are a number of other sensors on the Terra and Aqua satellites, but mostly for ocean color remote sensing, we are interested in the MODIS sensor. What is MODIS? MODIS is the Moderate Resolution Imaging Spectral Radiometer. It is designed for land, atmosphere, ocean, and cryosphere observations. 
It has a spatial resolution of one kilometer, but some of the bands sense at 250 meters and 500 meters. It is possible to interpolate the ocean color bands to 250 meters and 500 meters spatial resolution using the image processing software CDAS. While this may introduce some error, this enables the use of the imagery in coastal waters where the finer resolution is needed for the scale of processes occurring in these systems. Another satellite is the National Polar Partnership, also known as the SWOMI NPP. This satellite was launched in 2011 and provides global coverage. It has a 1.30 p.m. equator crossing time on a near daily revisit rate. The VIRS sensor is on the satellite and is used for ocean color remote sensing. The VIRS sensor is the Visible Infrared Imaging Radiometer Suite. It is designed to collect measurements of ocean color, clouds, aerosols, surface temperature, fires, and albedo. Between the MODIS and VIRS sensors, we've got the oceans covered. But satellites and their sensors do not operate indefinitely. Eventually, they come to the end of their functional life. This is why NASA and other space agencies are continuously investing effort in the development of new satellite sensors with new specifications and improvements to answer science questions. One example of an experimental sensor was the Hyperspectral Imager for the Coastal Ocean, or HICO. This was a partnership among the U.S. Naval Research Lab, or NRL, the Office of Naval Research, Oregon State University, and eventually NASA. It was a high spectral resolution imager. This type of sensor is sometimes referred to as an imaging spectrometer or as a hyperspectral imager, depending on the research community you are working with. HICO was designed and calibrated to collect over dark aquatic targets. This sensor was only supposed to have an operational lifetime of one year. It was installed on the ISS in 2009 and was able to collect data for five years, way beyond its expected lifetime. The imager was tasked to collect observations of specific targets defined by NRL and the scientific user community. These targets included open ocean, coastal, and inland waters. More information about HICO can be found in the above links. HICO data are available through the NASA Ocean Color Web Level 1 and Level 2 browser, which we will review a little bit later in this talk. An exciting aspect of this sensor is that it has now provided a five-year data set of hyperspectral remote sensing imagery that can be used for algorithm development for NASA's future hyperspectral satellite sensor. The newest ocean color satellite sensor under development at NASA is the Ocean Color Imager on the Plankton Aerosol Clouds Ocean Ecosystems, or PACE, satellite. This will be a polar orbiting sensor with a two-day revisit and one kilometer ground sample distance. The imagery will collect observations at high spectral resolution. On the right, you see an image showing the spectral resolution of legacy and current ocean color sensors. VIRS, MODIS, and I'm not going into um, CZCS or CWIFS for this session. The PACE sensor will have much higher spectral resolution in the visible range than these other sensors and will collect data in the shortwave infrared to improve on atmospheric correction. An optional polarimeter is being considered for this satellite for cloud and aerosol studies and to aid in atmospheric correction of the ocean radiometry. The proposed launch date is in the 2022 to 2023 timeframe. I encourage you to visit the link on this page to learn more about the preparatory activities for this new sensor and to think about how it might be used in answering applied science questions in the future. Satellite data are organized in a variety of ways reflecting different spatial, temporal, and parameter groupings. Over the years, certain terminology has arisen to describe these organizational conventions. Level zero data are unprocessed instrument data at full resolution. Any artifacts in these data from the communication of the spacecraft to the ground station have been removed. These data are the most raw format available and are only provided for a few of the missions NASA distributes data for. Level 1A data are reconstructed unprocessed instrument data at full resolution, 
time referenced and annotated with ancillary information, including radiometric and geometric calibration coefficients, and georeferencing parameters computed and appended but not applied to the level zero data. Level 1B data are level 1A data that have had instrument and radiometric calibrations applied. Level 2 data consist of derived geophysical variables at the same resolution as the source level 1 data. These variables, also called data products, include such data as chlorophyll, sea surface temperature, inherent optical properties, among others. Level 3 data are derived geophysical variables that have been aggregated or projected onto a well-defined spatial grid or over a well-defined time period. And level 4 data are model output or results from analyses at lower level data. It is possible to obtain data at any one of these processing levels, level 0 being the exception for some missions. Working with lower level data requires greater work effort and more advanced skill. Installed on a Linux or Mac OS X based platform, NASA's image processing software CDAS enables the processing of data through these different levels. So, how does a person go about finding and downloading satellite data? For the remainder of today's session, I will be going over how to obtain satellite data from a few of the data access tools commonly used by the research community and I will also introduce you to NASA's imaging process, image processing software named CDAS. Please recall from last week that this webinar series is focused on NASA and US-based satellite systems. There are other international satellites and image processing tools available to the public, but those are not the focus of this webinar. So, phytoplankton bloom in the Arabian Sea. I just wanted to take a step back for a moment and talk about why we as oceanographers might be interested in the inferences we can make from satellite remote sensing imagery. I'll take an example from one of my favorite websites, the NASA Earth Observatory. When I have time, sometimes even when I don't, I like to navigate this website to see highlights of how remote sensing imagery is being used to understand the Earth system. This example is from the Arabian Sea in February 2015 from the Aqua Modus sensor. Winter is the prime season to see filaments of phytoplankton curl and unfurl here as they ride the eddies that form in this current. You can see here these features. These are parts of the phytoplankton bloom moving along on those currents. Why do phytoplankton blooms happen in winter here? It turns out that this in this part of the world, it experiences large changes in seasonal wind patterns that affect the nutrient dynamics. Strong winds stir up nutrients from deeper waters, and those nutrients help phytoplankton thrive. This region has recently undergone a phase shift in species composition from diatoms, one type of phytoplankton, to the dinoflagellate Noctiluca scintillans. The surface waters of the region have experienced lower oxygen, oxygen concentrations and Noctiluca can survive and bloom in it, whereas other species cannot. This species shift could have implications for the food web of the Arabian Sea. What does that mean in terms of applied science? This phase shift may have an impact on higher trophic level species and on the livelihoods of local people who depend on fish as their primary source of protein. This example from the Arabian Sea made me wonder if I could find satellite data from another winter bloom and process the data to see those twists and curls of phytoplankton. Worldview is a web-based application for interactively browsing global, full-resolution satellite imagery and then downloading the underlying data. The Browse feature that lets you step through time is really useful if you want to search image scenes without first having to go through the effort of processing the data to find features such as that phytoplankton bloom I was interested in. You can step through the time in this part of the web tool. Worldview makes available over 100 data products, and most of them are updated in near real time for the entire Earth. This supports time-critical applications such as flood monitoring, air quality monitoring, and wildfire management. To start, <clears throat> I wanted to just browse satellite data to see if there was a recent period when there was a phytoplankton bloom in the Arabian Sea. So I zoomed into the Arabian Sea. 
In the tool, I can click the red Add Layers button to call up a search window. From here, I navigate to the bottom right of that search window and choose Other. If I'm given a window, will open and give me the choice to add one of the data products. In this case, I added Chlorophyll A. There, another window opens and prompts me to choose Chlorophyll A for the Terra Modus and Aqua Modus sensors. After closing this window, I can see the chlorophyll data layer overlaying on top of the true color image, and I've zoomed up on a snapshot of that here. If I click in the camera icon in the upper right corner of the web page, I can define the region to save it in one of a number of formats, including JPEG and GeoTIFF. So you can see here in these formats. It looks like December 1st, 2015 will be a good day to study because I already because already I can see the swirl of phytoplankton just offshore of Muscat Oman right here. Really nice eddy feature. If your intention is to work with more than just images, but with the underlying radiometry and data products, then the data access tools at the NASA Ocean Color Web is what you will need. NASA's Ocean Color Web is supported by the Ocean Biology Processing Group, or OBPG, at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Their responsibilities include the collection, processing, calibration, validation, archive, and distribution of ocean-related products from a large number of operational satellite-based remote sensing missions, providing ocean color, sea surface temperature, and sea surface salinity data to the international research community. They've been doing this since 1996. When you explore the website, you will find information about the missions they support, as you see listed here, the data access tools that they have available. And there are several methods, and we will walk through the Level 1 and 2 browser and the Level 3 browser, though they have more. Documentation related to the data products and calibration and validation of data. You can also see information from meetings and workshops and other educational materials. And not highlighted here is if you look into their services tab, you will find helpful links to the user forum, which you can register for. It's a very dynamic community of extremely helpful people. And their image processing software, CDAS, which we'll cover later in this talk. This website provides a wealth of helpful information on becoming proficient at accessing processing and understanding ocean color satellite imagery. I encourage you to explore the data access capability offered by the Ocean Color Web so that you may obtain data in a format and method that suits your needs. There are a number of ways you can download data using this website. I will discuss two of them here, the Level 1 and 2 browser and the Level 3 browser. First, the Level 1 and 2 browser. The splash screen of the Level 1 and 2 browser is what you see here. It's a little active, so I will walk you through the sections. The browser allows you to select which sensor you would like to use. <clears throat> if you look in the upper left area, you can see here that the Aqua Modus sensor is selected, and I'm also pointing at it with the green arrow. Let's say you want to use HICO data in your dissertation. Note the checkbox where you can select the sensor in addition to MODIS. It's right here. You can also click off of MODIS if you don't want that sensor as well. Looking at the right side, you can choose either a predefined region, as I've done here with the Arabian Sea highlighted in red, or you can actually enter and define a bounding box of your own region of interest. You just put in the longitude and the latitude here. Back on the left, <clears throat> you define the area and swatch size and swath size and which percentage of clouds may obscure the image scene you're requesting. You can choose the month by year in the bottom left table. So here I've selected December 2015. I'm kind of cheating here because I already looked at the world view and I know that there's a bloom over in the Arabian Sea December 1st. I can also choose the day of the month that I'm interested in. 
And finally, when I want, I think that I've got everything entered correctly, I'll just glance back over it to make sure that nothing's changed itself. I'll click on Find Swaths to submit my request to the system. A few, a few moments after I submit my request, a new page loads, and that gives me choices of which scene I want to view. Since my date range was only limited to one day and I'm only searching for aqua modus imagery, there are very few image scenes that fit my request. If I were requesting a larger date range, there would be a lot more images in this window. If you look at the images here on the screen, you can tell just by looking at it that one of them has a lot of data in it and the others are a little bit more patchy or scattered. It's pretty obvious which one I want to choose here and it's this image here on the left. And you just click it with the mouse. A new window will open showing me a true color, chlorophyll, and sea surface temperature scene, as well as information about where this image was collected on the globe. In the upper part of the page, you will see several hyperlinks for imagery files. I've obscured them a little bit with the red boxes, but there are five. One, two, three, four, five. The name of the file incorporates the sensor name, A for aqua, the date and time of collection, the processing level, and the data product suite where applicable. I'm searching for or interested in the ocean color or OC suite and the sea surface temperature suite. I just click on those to begin the download. These files can be very large, so I recommend downloading when you are on your fastest available internet connection. When you are finished downloading, you can open these files in CDAS, which we will cover in the next section. Before going into CDAS, though, I'll review a few more data access tools. Excuse me. The first, next one is the Level 3 browser, available through the NASA, NASA Ocean Color Web. If you are interested in accessing global data composites at various spatial and temporal scales, then the Level 3 browser is a good starting point. At the top of this page, highlighted in red, you will see drop-down menus where you can select standard, experimental, or test data, and standard is the one that's selected here, the type of data product, and also the sensor that it comes from, so in this example, SNPP VIRS chlorophyll concentration using the OCI algorithm, the spatial scale and the temporal scale of, um, of the data. The results will be images of scenes yielded from these search parameters. And you can see them here, these images that, are, um, that look like the globe and this distribution of chlorophyll. I've chosen monthly, so you can see that it's organized by month. And all I have to do is click on one of those images to, to call it up. Are you interested in monthly patterns of chlorophyll? I find that creating animations of monthly composites to be a useful tool to convey monthly and seasonal patterns in global chlorophyll. Last week, I got an email from one of the participants asking me if it's possible to teach high school students using remote sensing. I find that having students download the data from this browser um, search window and create animations and then make observations of the patterns could be one way to introduce them to these ideas. There are other three other access, data access tools we will discuss. The NOAA Coastwatch tool, NASA Giovanni, and the USGS Earth Explorer, where you will learn to access Landsat data. The NOAA Coastwatch tool is organized into regional nodes. Each node serves the needs of its regional user community. Here you will see the West Coast Coastwatch node. I can search its data catalog for data sets they have processed and are serving to their users. On the left side of this image, you will see that a number of ocean color data products from various satellite sensors are available. Some of these are confined to the nodes region and some are global. This node also serves sea surface temperature and wind and current data you can see in the tabs listed near ocean color. In this example, I have selected Chlorophyll A Beers N Global 2012 Now data product. If I click on the Access Data button highlighted in red, I will be taken to the page where I can download the data. On this new page, I can refine my region and other parameters, select the data output file type, 
and download the data. Depending on the format I choose, I can then work with this downloaded data in CDAS. Another tool is Giovanni, or the Geospatial Interactive Online Visualization and Analysis Infrastructure. It is a web-based application that provides a simple and intuitive way to visualize, analyze, and access Earth science remote sensing data without steps that you would need to make some analysis. Follow the link at the top of this page to get started. Giovanni permits the user to customize selections to gain an understanding of the Earth system. You can choose the type of plot you wish to make. In this case, I've selected a time average map for the time period of 2004 to 2016 and the Arabian Sea region, back to that Arabian Sea idea. On the left panel, I've made other choices for discipline, in this case, ocean biology and oceanography, the measurements, platform, and my temporal resolution. Giovanni has presented me with two options for chlorophyll, and I will choose one of them. Here you see that I can choose my region not using a map, and in this case, I'm selecting only for December 15, 2015 as my time period to correspond with the winter phytoplankton bloom in the Arabian Sea example. When I'm finished with my selections, I click, click the green plot data button down here in the lower right. In this example, I'm only looking at one month, so my wait, list, or wait time is short. Your wait time may be longer if you are requesting a longer time period. When your query is complete, you will be given the option to zoom in to the scene, change colors in the color bar, so you can change, and also the scale of how you want to display these data. And you can save this image in a number of formats. You also have the option to click on download data to actually download the data and not just the image. You will have a number of data format options available for download. The USGS Earth Explorer website allows you to custom tailor your search parameters for Landsat and other sensors data. In this example, I'm just going to be talking about Landsat. After registering, enter the website and search by data by first selecting a region by either entering a place name or its coordinates. I chose Rio de Janeiro, a nice place to visit. Next, what you want to do is you want to click <clears throat> which data set you want to search for. In this case, I've selected Landsat 8, as you can see here. There are several options and a few that are below this that are not displayed here on this image. But in this case, I'm using this example for Landsat 8. And then you'll click on Results. A list of image scenes will be displayed on the left. Just click on the image of the one that interests you to see a quick look of the scene. So it's a little bit in the background here, but this is the list of images that will be displayed here in the background. And you'll be given a choice to um, just click on the image, and that's what you'll see popping up right here. You'll then have the option to download the data. There's an icon here that's a little green arrow that's pointing down. It's a little bit grayed out here. You'll just click on that, and this download options window will pop up. You'll have a choice of which image file to download. For my uses, I typically download the level one GeoTIFF, and I work with the data in CDAS. So now you've learned several methods for accessing and downloading data. It is a lot of information to take in. And remember, we have these links that are in the pod over here um, so that you can follow those links. In time, you may find that you gravitate towards one of the methods over the others depending on your needs, and that is normal. In this next section, I will give you an overview of NASA's CDAS image processing tool which can be used to visualize and process the remote sensing data you just learned how to obtain. So now you've learned several methods for accessing and downloading data. It is a lot of information. 
if you move on to the CDAS link that you see here in the upper part, CDAS was originally developed for the CWIF sensor and derives its name from the CWIF data analysis system, but now it supports most U.S. and international ocean color missions. It is a comprehensive image analysis package for the processing, display, analysis, and quality control of ocean color data. It is freely available through the NASA Ocean Color website. CDAS is well supported with online tools, help pages, and active user community in the Ocean Color Forum, and an attentive and friendly support team based at NASA Goddard. The CDAS team at NASA Goddard has put together a suite of freely available on-demand tutorials and a webinar on how to install and use CDAS. While I can only give you an overview of some of the functionality of the software as a part of this webinar, it is through these tutorials at the CDAS webpage, the webinar that they've provided, and through your own use that you can learn how to use the program. CDAS is intuitive to use and does not take very long to learn. Since CDAS supports such a wide variety of satellite sensors, your time investment in learning it will be time well spent. Again, these links are in the link file that's available to you in the files pod. What are some of the features of CDAS? For visualization, it provides for very fast image display and navigation so that you can explore your data, advanced data layer management, flexible band math capability, and accurate reprojection and masking. For data processing, CDAS permits users to process satellite data through a number of processing levels. Some users wish to have more control over the inputs used for atmosphere correction or for the generation of ocean color data products. The ability to process through these different levels gives the user more flexibility in generating their own custom data sets for their science needs. CDAS can be installed on Linux, Mac OS X, and Windows systems. The Windows version currently only allows for visualization and does not support data processing. When you are ready to use CDAS, first watch the tutorial, The Basics, Getting Started, on the CDAS Tutorials page. This will guide you on how to download the installer and any ancillary code for your operating system and for your needs. Here's what CDAS looks like when you first open it. Across the top, you will have a menu bar and activity icons. So your menu bar across the top here, this is in a, a Mac setting, and these activity icons that you can click on. Some of them are grayed out now. Some of them are active, like this one here in the corner. This is the default layout. On the left panel will be your data layer management, your mask manager, and color management. In the middle blue region here is where your image will appear when opened. On the right will be information related to where your image is from, and information on the geolocation and values of the data products as you move your mouse over the scene. Opening the data is really intuitive. Just click on the folder icon and a window will appear. If you look here in this window, these are the data that we downloaded earlier in this session using the Level 1 and Level 2 browser. You can select one or more of these NetCDF or .nc files to be read by CDAS. The files will appear on the left, as you see here in this panel. This is the file manager. I clicked on the little high piece next to rasters on both of these files, so it would open it up so you could see what was in there. What I did is I double-clicked on this chlorophyll icon, and the image that you see here appeared. I did apply a gray land mask, which I'm not going to discuss how to do so in this um, talk today. Recall the visualization of this scene using the NASA Worldview tool, tool earlier in this session. Remember that little swirl of phytoplankton that we saw offshore of Muscat, Oman? Now using this tool, you can roll your mouse over the scene and see what the data values are for that region. 
If you look over here in the rasters section panel on the right side of the window, you can see what the estimate for chlorophyll A is in this location that I've highlighted or that I'm pointing at here with the arrow. Furthermore, you can adjust the scaling on the color bar. All I did was click on this tab right here in the color for the image by selecting the color management tab on the left panel of the window. In this case, I have chosen to represent chlorophyll in a log 10 scale. So all I did was click this log 10 button. <clears throat> for this webinar session using CDAS, I've shown you how to open a file, open a data layer in a file, explore the data by using your mouse hovering over the scene, and observing the data values in the raster panel. CDAS has so much more functionality than I can demonstrate in this webinar session. I strongly urge you to follow the CDAS tutorials and webinar. Again, the software is intuitive and worth the time investment to learn. You will learn to use the tools, including pixel extraction and color management, how to manage layers and apply masks, how to process, mosaic, and reproject your data, depending on your data needs, the Linux and Mac OS X installations permit you to process through different levels. And finally, it is possible to compute statistics on your scene. CDAS has a great deal of functionality, and with just another two to three hours of time investment in the tutorials and the webinar, you too can be up and running and using it. So that's a lot of information to cover in one webinar session. To recap, we reviewed some of the fundamentals from last week. We reviewed commonly used NASA and US-based satellites and sensors used for coastal and open ocean applications. We talked about processing level. I showed you several NASA satellite data access tools. And I gave an overview of NASA's CDAS image processing software. Thank you for your participation today. As a reminder, next week we will be discussing animal movement and migration, and we will have a special guest, Dr. Mitchell Roffer. With the time remaining, I'll answer any questions you may have. Thank you. OK, so a couple of questions are here about Giovanni. And I didn't really go into a great deal of detail here, because I kept referencing it to as a data access tool. But Really, what Giovanni allows you to do is it allows you to analyze large data sets without actually bringing those data into your system and doing all the pre-processing that you would need to do to um, get to the point of coming to some synthesis. So um, Giovanni allows you to do both of those. And it's a really powerful tool. The more you use it, the more you can find that you can make inferences from the data and still get the final data products from it. Another area of discussion, and I kind of touched on this a little while ago on talking about the data portals, is that as you become more familiar with these different data portal access tools, the data portals, um, you may find that you tend to use one over the other. But there's actually a lot of um, uh, overlap in the different tools and the sorts of data that they can provide to you and the different levels. And as you use them, you will become more familiar with which tools are more appropriate, and still that some of the tools do have overlap. And it, it kind of is a matter of a personal preference. OK, so there's one person who's acting, asking about higher resolution imagery for detecting algae. Um, I'm guessing that this person is asking about higher spectral resolution imagery. Um, because that's the direction that we're taking in trying to identify different, uh, to try to resolve the biodiversity of algae, and if we think of it in terms of size class um, or in terms of taxonomy. Um, the HICO sensor may be something, a sensor of interest because that has hyperspectral imagery. The one drawback with the HICO sensor is that it's no longer operational. So it would be necessary to depend on existing data sets. And it's, there's a good chance, although not a guarantee, that there um, will be difficult to access information on the validation data or the in-water data that may have been collected during the time that the HICO sensor collected imagery. I didn't go into a great deal of detail on this, um, but in the Ocean Color Web website, um, there is access to ground or sea truth data um, through CBAS and the Ocean Color DAC. 
And so it might be worthwhile for the user who's interested in using HICO data to see if there may be some matchups with um, in-water data collected at the same time. A question about CDAS visualizing Landsat data, and it is possible to do so. CDAS is pretty flexible on um, how you operate it. So and if you have any doubts, try downloading some data and visualizing it in CDAS and see uh, where that takes you. Again, the C I point you all to the CDAS website for further training on using the tool. My focus is generally not on Landsat data. I usually use MODIS and HICO data for my research. Um, but I encourage you to, to check out the tools and the trainings that they have available. I too would love it if they could make the Windows operating system process between levels, but I have no power over influencing the group and making that happen. So a couple of you have asked when are they going to make that possible. I would say to direct your questions to the Ocean Biology Processing Group to see um, when that might happen. Okay, so. I see again here, and I'm really excited that you guys are so excited about this topic, a few more specific questions on like um, sediment flow, sediment depth accumulation, lake behind a dam, papers. If you're interested in a little bit more detail, I encourage you, please send me an email and I will respond to you um, and I'll, I'll attach any papers that I'm aware of um, to try to help you with some of your questions that are more detailed. Thank you for your participation today. As a reminder, next week we will be discussing animal movement and migration, and we will have a special guest, Dr. Mitchell Roffer.